the Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison, just announced a do not travel level four travel ban to every single country in the world. At the similar time, he also instilled non-essential gatherings going from 500 people maximum to now 100. But in a similar time, he also told everybody to stop hoarding. Here's why you're wrong, Prime Minister, with all due respect. One, you said stop hoarding. It's not sensible, not helpful. It's disappointing and it's un-Australian. Classic appeal to patriotism, trying to manipulate and to control thought via an appeal to patriotism, which may work for some, but doesn't work for me. Uh, we get it. A country and a government wants to, remain, wants to keep semblance of normalcy and control. They don't want their people to get out of control and for anarchy to proliferate. Number one, your definition of hoarding is quite wrong. How should I say very clearly? Hoarding, we all know, is characterized by the difficulty of discarding with objects or possessions because of a perceived need to save them. People hoard also because they believe that the item will be useful or valuable in the future. This is not hoarding. This is preparing. See, for many... It is the fear, panic, and basic logic that is inducing rational preparedness because people believe their resources, freedom, and mobility will be limited in the future based off evidence that is already happening all around the world. And so to say stop hoarding is, and to try and control the population, it makes sense. I understand. Things are getting out of control. What's happening? This is not how we should act. People are fighting in in supermarkets. People, People are getting stabbed. There are people getting stabbed outside supermarkets. There are long lines. There are people fighting over toilets. That's real. It's a minority. But there is a lot of tension and stress around the perception of uh, the, cap- the capacity to which we can feed our nation and the capacity to which the supplies are able to feed the populace. And what has been done in response is that grocery stores have put a limit all around the world, including in my country of Australia. They have now limited, all major grocery stores have now limited A maximum of two items. It went from down to five, now it's down to two. Two items on the majority of items, okay? What does this do to the mentality of the consumer? Well, let let me tell you what, what it can do and what it will likely do based on basic psychology. You see, when we put a limiter on a basic necessity need, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, food, shelter, water, it's a priority. You see, when you put a limiter on this, it forces the consumer number one, into the store much more frequently than they were if to buy four to eight weeks worth of food. So now you're causing people to much more frequently influx your store because they can only buy two items per thing. They have a family of four, three, five, six, seven. They run out of that within a week. They have to go back. Oh, they have to go back again because the item wasn't there. Suddenly now people are going to the grocery store well more than they've ever gone not only because they need to prepare for the future, but because they cannot buy all the essential goods they need because grocery stores have put a limit because naturally they're out of stock. And so they want to flatten their own curve like we're trying to do with the spreadability of this virus. They're trying to flatten their own curve and to make the supply last longer. Quite coincidental, we're trying to flatten the curve there. Grocery stores are doing a very effective job at it right now because they control the supply. Moreover, let's talk about the fact that when you put a limit on the amount of goods that one can access and you do it in a grocery store and then you also tell people, hey, you can't gather in more than 100 people in one room and you go to grocery stores and what do you see? Oftentimes more than 100 people all gathering around in close proximity, running around for food, touching, grabbing, coughing, breathing, Panting, yelling, fighting, seems to almost defeat the purpose when majority of grocery stores now have more than 100 people in them, often at once, potentially hundreds depending on how big the grocery store is. Seems a bit counterintuitive to me. An education campaign that teaches people on the preparedness equipment that they need 
No. Do you need 100 rolls of toilet paper? Newsflash. You can't feed your children with toilet paper. You can't eat toilet paper. When you got more toilet paper than you can wipe away food, you got a problem. Okay? So, food, clean water, water filtration, electricity supply if the power goes out, solar panels. Do you have your own source of vegetables? A vegetable garden, perhaps. We need to educate the populace on how they can be less reliant on the system. But why would the system want to teach the people that? Then they would make less money. Then they would have less control. So now it is up to the individual, like us, to help each other. And so the solution to me is education and allowing people to buy as much as they want and prepare as much as they want Because potential catastrophe and misfortune and difficult circumstances are coming. Not if, but when. And so if the shelves are empty, then you say, hey, we'll restock up tomorrow. And then again the next day. And then you realize people suddenly don't need to keep buying because they have their stores. They go to the shops every couple of weeks, every month now, instead of every couple of days. And suddenly now we can mitigate a spread because less people are in a store at once, looking at the long term. However, by putting the limiter on two per, and whatever it is, two, three, like you can use your own example, right? When you put a limiter on the amount that someone is able to get access to a certain good, you create and cultivate a scarcity mindset, giving the appearance things are more limited when they actually are, hence creating more demand. Now, while things are actually quite limited and it's not more than they actually are, eventually supplies will more come in and people and like the ban will still remain or the ban, the the, the, the limit will still remain because they want to maintain supplies for the future because they know if they lift it, people might go in again and panic buy. That's the quote that's being used. Now, here's the problem with that mentality. Here's the problem with the mentality that you calling it hoarding, people calling it hoarding. And it, it, it could, I could care less who said it. I could care less if it's the prime minister or your next door neighbor, right? It's the pervasive mentality that hoarding is a negative thing. That it's even hoarding, which is actually factually incorrect, just based on the basic definition. You see, we are only here because our grandparents and ancestors prepared ahead of time of stress and hardship. They put away food and planned against potential misfortune. Why don't we think we should do the same? Why do we think we are an exception to that? In fact... We are now realizing we are not. We are realizing we are looking around the world and we are seeing a potential future that we could be living. There are countries that have laws now where if you go outside and you are sick with this virus, you can get sent to jail for three months. Now, I cannot recall which country that is, but I promise you there are laws like that out there in countries around Europe and uh, coming to America. Europe has been hit very hard, so they're going harder with those laws. Jail for three months. There is now a 20, if I recall correctly, there is a $20,000 fine. Let me look it up. Travelers returning to South Australia face fines of up to $20,000 for ignoring strict coronavirus isolation rules. You see, we are creating all these rules around limitations, rightfully so, to try and mitigate the spread and get people to take this seriously. Now, while we're here, we might be here, and I'm putting my hand up in the middle, like uh, in the middle of a scale. Relative to other countries, we're doing okay. We ain't no UK, we ain't no Spain, we ain't no US, we ain't no Germany or France. Not yet. But we can see ahead of time, and we've seen that people who are in much worse situations, they didn't prepare early enough. They got caught off guard. They weren't proactive. You see... That can easily be us. Now, we're fortunate we're, we're, we're a landlocked country where we can only travel interstate. We can't go country to country. You have to travel by air or sea. So that gives us an advantage to the spreadability and access to our country. Okay? That's positive. However, if you look at the coronavirus trajectories, I'm going to put this up on the YouTube and Facebook video because I think this is such an important graph that I don't think the government of Australia has seen or has acknowledged or is take maybe they have and they're taking into consideration right now. But it doesn't seem so. What I'm looking at, for those who are just listening, 
on the screen is a graph of all the countries' trajectories of how coronavirus has traveled since a, the, the number of days since the 100th case. Since the 100th, 100th case, as of today, Australia is in about on its 8th or ninth day. Okay? Now, we are heading in a similar trajectory to all those other countries who have thousands and thousands of cases. I'm talking about the Swedens, the Belgians, the UKs, the Switzerlands, the US, the Spain, the Germany, the France, the Iran, the Italy. Now, are we going at the same rate? No. They are going at around about a 33% daily increase. We are going at around about a 20% daily increase. While Japan, Singapore, and Hong Kong, who have done very good jobs at mitigating this spread, at, a, at around half that. We're looking at a 10, 8, or 5 now, I'm estimating based on my eye, and I haven't done the actual calculations, but you can say they're approximate, okay? Now, unless the country of Australia instills strict isolation rules, unless they stop a everybody from coming in except Australian citizens, then it will continue to rise. Until the schools are closed, for example, because we know why kids can be asymptomatic for a long period, sorry, they can be asymptomatic for like all, but they show very minimal signs of symptoms, but they still can get it and spread it. Until things like universities and schools are completely shut, it'll continue to rise. Until we are proactive instead of reactive, then we will get to the point where people will be thankful that they hoarded, quote unquote because they prepared for a time where they think they're going to have to stay in their home for four to eight weeks. And if they go outside, they risk infection, illness, contributing to an overwhelmed medical system and economy, and possibly for a small minority, death. Now, this is a very real reality that makes people want to have supplies for the future. It is not bad to have supplies for the future. In fact, it is great because this is an example, this is a test for every single human being that we are so intertwined with the supply chains and we are so reliant on other big organizations, globalized organizations for our well-being and health. They have these tentacles all through our well-being and survival. And when it gets mitigated and taken away, people panic. They're fearful. They're not ready. And we need to be. And so having four to eight weeks worth of food, clean water, having water filtration, having your own vegetable garden, having your own electricity generator are all basic things that why not? pretty much every human should have. Tell me why we shouldn't be prepared for a potential future. It's not just the virus. Natural disasters, um, EMPs, man-made or from the solar flare. Like there's unlimited examples of how catastrophes can occur. A coronavirus has hit us every 10 years in this 21st century. What makes you think it's not? The prime minister says this is a once in a hundred year event. Well, Coronavirus has hit every 100 years, and while the severity hasn't been the same, because every strain of coronavirus is, is different from an RNA level and spreadability and mortality level, to, be, to think that this can't happen again even worse in our lifetime is ignorant. Lastly, he said there is no reason to be uh, hoarding supplies in fear of a lockdown. Are you implying that there won't be a lockdown? You've decided no matter what, there will, we will not lock our citizens down. Because if that is true, then we are for damn sure going to be, in my estimation, a similar situation to all those countries who are at the top of the curve and who haven't controlled it, who have thousands and thousands of cases. We are for damn sure going to be in that similar situation. But maybe he was just saying that because he's talking about the current situation, or maybe he's just saying that to, to, to keep people calm or a combination of both. But when, here's what most people do, most organizations do. You have a stimulus, you have a problem, and you react to it. You have another stimulus, another problem, and you react to it. Instead, how about we think ahead to the potential problems and misfortunes that may occur, because they will, and we plan ahead, and we're proactive instead of reactive. So guess what? Get four to eight weeks worth of food, if you can, begin getting a vegetable garden. You can grow your own food. Get a freezer that can contain all these things. 
get a water fil- filter. You can get them very cheap on Amazon. They can filter years worth of water. Get basic cleaning equipment, bleach, about a third cup of bleach and a gallon of water, 4.5 liters, is the ratio that is effective at killing surface-bound viruses. Okay, and I talked about that in my larger video, more so in the details there. Prepare for the future. Don't feel guilted by individuals who are trying to trick you that, oh, preparing is bad under the guise that it's hoarding. You are not hoarding. You are taking basic supplies for your family and your friends if needed for the potential, likely misfortune and difficult circumstances that are likely to arise in the future. If you do not prepare, you will panic in the future. Prepare now. So you can thrive instead of just barely survive. I did a full two hour analysis of the coronavirus for those who want to see it. It's linked around. You can see it on my Facebook, on my YouTube. If you want to know all the details around this, all the aggregation of information that it can be quite overwhelming. I've already created this a few days ago to answer all those questions about the details of the virus, the spreadability, every single category that you could imagine covered in a video for people to understand. I hope this puts perspective and gives some perspective to people. 